Hi, this is Brian Peckham from Whitman, Massachusetts. Coming to t tonight because I have a word from the Lord for you tonight. And I feel that of the Lord to bring this message to you tonight. It's a very hardcore message that I'm going to be bringing forth to you tonight. And, and one thing that the Lord has instructed me to do is to be very, very firm and very blunt as I bring forth this message to you. And that's exactly what I am going to do. So, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me tonight to the book of Luke. Luke the 22nd chapter. I'm going to read verses 31 through 34. And then I'm going to read verses 54 through 62. Luke 22, verses 31 through, through 34. And Jesus is saying to Peter here, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift each of you like wheat. But I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. So when you have repented and turned to me again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said, Lord, I am ready to go to prison with you and even to die with you. But Jesus said, Peter, let me tell you something. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny three times that you even know me. And skipping down to verses 54 through 62. So they arrested him, they arrested Jesus, and led him to the high priest's home. And Peter followed at a distance. The guards lit a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat around it, and Peter joined them there. A servant girl noticed him in the firelight and began staring at him. Finally, she said, this man was one of Jesus' followers. But Peter denied it. Woman, he said, I don't even know him. After a while, someone else looked at him and said, you must be one of them. No, man, I'm not, Peter retorted. About an hour later, someone else insisted, this, may, this must be one of them because he is a Galilean too. But Peter said, man, I don't know what you are talking about. And immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. At that moment, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Suddenly, the Lord's words flashed through Peter's mind before the rooster crows tomorrow morning. You will deny three times that you even know me. And Peter left the courtyard weeping bitterly. And tonight, I want to talk to you on, on the subject here. Will you 
say that you know him or will you deny him? There's a lot of stuff that is happening in the world today and people are being asked if they know Jesus or not. Will you say, yes, I know Jesus and I have a relationship with him? Or, or will you be like Simon Peter and say, I do not know this man? And yet, deep down in your heart, you do. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I pray right now, Lord God, that you will use me to speak to your people. Lord, I pray that the words that that come forth out of my mouth, Father, Lord God, I pray that they won't be the words coming forth. Lord God, that they'll be your words that come forth out of my mouth, Lord God. Lord, let me speak to your people what it is that you want me to speak to them, Father. And Lord, I pray that as each person hears this video and listens to it, Lord God, Lord, I pray that you will give them the revelation knowledge, Lord God, of what it is that you're revealing to them, Lord God. Lord, I pray that you will give them the ears to hear and the eyes to see what it is that you are revealing to them, Lord God, and what you are placing in their heart, Lord God. Lord, give me a boldness and a fire, Lord God, to bring forth this message, Lord God. And Lord, I pray that lives will be changed through this message, Lord God. And Lord God, I will give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. There is this terrorist group overseas called ISIS. I'm pretty sure a lot of you have been watching and listening to the news about what's going on over in Iraq and Syria. A lot is going on over there and sad to say that none of it is good. There are people that are over there that are in fear of their lives and one thing that Satan is trying to do he is trying to sift each of them like wheat just like he tried to do with the 12 disciples 2,000 years ago Satan has asked, has asked to sift each of you like wheat but you see the Lord is in prayer the Lord is in prayer not just like he was for Peter he is in prayer for us that we will not fail he is in prayer for us that that we will not be in a place of fear and this is what Peter was saying. Peter was saying, 
Lord, I will die for you. But the Lord said to Peter, before this very night, before uh, you will deny three, before the cock crows twice, you will deny three times that you know me in everything. And over in Iraq and in Syria, people are, uh, Christian people over there are being killed for their faith. And the, and the question that I want to ask each and every single one of you, if you were faced in that situation, like the Apostle Peter, and just like those people over in Iraq and Syria, what would you do? If someone had a gun up to you, to your head, wanting to blow your brains out, because you love the Lord, and the person says to you, do you love the Lord? If you love the Lord, you're going to get your head blown in. What are you going to do if you are in a situation like this? Ladies and gentlemen, it's happening. It's happening in Iraq and in Syria. And ladies and gentlemen, it is about to happen. It's about to take place right here in America. Ladies and gentlemen, it's just not going to be taking place over in Iraq and Syria. The ISIS terrorist group, they're pretty much all over the place right now trying to get who they can convert. But ladies and gentlemen, those of you that love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and might, what would you do if someone from that group came up to you and asked you if you believe in God, what would you do? Would you admit that you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Or would you deny Jesus Christ. And ladies and gentlemen, the one thing that I want to tell you is this. You see, if you try to save your life, if you try to save your life and deny Christ, I just want to let you know something. God knows if you're going to confess that you know Him before your, your friends or your enemies. Right now I'm using the, the ISIS group as an example right now because it is happening folks and we could face this. We could face this. And what are you going to do if you are faced with a situation like this? Are you going to admit or deny? If you deny the Lord, the Lord knows. Because the Lord clearly states in His Word that He will never leave us or forsake us. So the Lord will know whether or not you admit that you know him or deny him. You see, in, in Peter's case, you see, Jesus saw everything that went on. Jesus saw Peter's three denials. He knew it. He knew it was going to happen. 
Peter said, oh Lord, I'm going to be bold. I'm going to admit that I know you. But what did he do? He denied him. You see, Jesus clearly stated in, in the Gospel of, of Matthew, and you know, and he was so right. When he said, when he said these words, when he said in Matthew chapter 26, verse 41, when he said, For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. So when Peter denied Jesus 2,000 years ago, Peter let human emotions get the best of him. He made the flesh get the best of him. You see, his spirit man wanted to do the right thing. His spirit man wanted to do the right thing. But what did Peter do? He gave into the flesh. You see, folks, there are times when we are going to have to learn to give into what the Spirit wants to do instead of giving into the flesh. And you see, we should not give into the flesh when it comes to our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Ooh, that was good. I'm going to say that again. We should not give into the flesh when it comes to our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Our relationship with Jesus Christ should be serious. Our relationship with Jesus Christ should be serious and our relationship with Jesus Christ should be our number one priority. You see, if we say that we do not know God, God knows what you are saying. You see, if you were to deny if you were to deny your Heavenly Father to a group like ISIS, it, you know what, Never, uh, let's forget about ISIS for, uh, for a second. Let's say if you were to deny God before your friends or your family or your loved ones. You see, in, in Mark, the, uh, the eighth chapter in Mark the eighth chapter verse 38 I'm going I'm going to give you 13 verses about what the Bible says about denying Jesus Christ Mark chapter 8 verse 38 and this is what it says it says if anyone is ashamed of me and my message in these adulterous and sinful days, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So, so Jesus constantly turns the world's perspective upside down with talk of first and last, saving and losing. Here he gives us a choice. We can reject Jesus now and be rejected by him at his second coming, or we can accept him now and be accepted by him then. Rejecting Christ may help us escape shame for the time being 
but it will guarantee an eternity of shame later. And getting back to the, uh, the ISIS group, like if someone were to kill you for your faith, you see, if you deny Jesus, you'll feel guilty. You will feel guilty for doing it because the Apostle Peter felt guilty right after he denied Jesus three times. The word of the Lord, it clearly states that Peter wept bitterly. Peter remembered what Jesus said. When Jesus said, this very night before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he remembers the words Jesus said. And after he does what he does, the mindset comes into Peter and he's like, Dear God, what in the world have I done? So if you're ashamed of the Lord, He will be ashamed of you. Verse 2 Timothy 1.8 And it says here, So never be ashamed to tell others about our Lord. And don't be ashamed of me either, even though I'm in prison for him. With the strength God gives you, be ready to suffer with me for the sake of the good news. So, if in this time of mounting persecution, Timothy may have been afraid to continue preaching the good news. His fears were based on fact because believers were being arrested, and they are today, and executed like they are today. Paul told Timothy to expect suffering. Timothy, like Paul, would be jailed for preaching the good news, which we see in Hebrews 13.23, and I'll read that verse in a moment. But Paul promised Timothy that God would give him strength and that he would be ready when it was his time to suffer. Even when there is no persecution, sharing our faith can be difficult. Fortunately, we like Paul and Timothy can rely on the Holy Spirit to give us coverage. Don't be ashamed to testify of your personal faith in Jesus Christ. So don't be ashamed to say to people, you know him, and you are proud that you know him. You see, you see, if you deny him, you feel guilty. You see, if you didn't, I mean, if we convert, uh, I mean, the ISIS group, I mean, Christians have, I, I mean, Christians have converted over to Islam because they were in fear of their life. But you see, is life on earth more meaningful to you than eternal life with Christ Jesus? You see, life on earth here only lasts for a season. We're gonna die one day here on this earth. We're going to die here on this earth. We're not going to live forever on this earth. So what is more important, ladies and gentlemen, your relationship with Christ or your temporary life here on earth or converting to another religion that believes in a different God. You see, the, the uh, radical Islams, you see, they don't believe in the 
in, in the same God as Christians do. They believe in Allah. But if you read the Word of God, if you if you read the Word of God and, and you studied the Word of God, Allah does not appear in the Word of God. So if it does not appear in the Word of God, then it doesn't exist. You will not find Muhammad in the Word of God. You will not find Buddha in the Word of God. The only thing that you will find in the Word of God is Jesus Christ. That is the only thing, ladies and gentlemen, that you will find in the Word of God. And if you deny Jesus to anybody here on earth, do you want Jesus to deny you before his Father? Like, and, and he said it in Mark chapter 8, verse 38. He said, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his fathers, of his Father with the holy angels. So what are you going to do, people? Life on earth here is only for a season. But life with Jesus is eternal. Just like it says in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he sent his Son. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Folks, what is more important? What is more important? Eternal life or temporary life? What is eternal life? Non-ending life you see when you're when when you're when you're in heaven before the king of kings and the lord of lords and he says to you well done O good and faithful servant you see what does he do you you're welcomed into heaven the place that 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 he has prepared for you and for me and that place is eternal, where there's no more death, no more suffering, and no more pain. You see, in heaven, we won't have to deal with the garbage that we are dealing with here on earth. In heaven, we won't deal, you won't have to worry about dealing with terrorist groups. In heaven, you won't have to worry about dealing with the demonic forces of Satan. You won't have any of that nonsense to deal with once you're with Jesus. You won't have any of that to worry about, ladies and gentlemen. But down here on this earth, it's temporary. Who cares about ISIS? If they want to kill you because you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, then let them kill you. Let them behead you. Because if you know Jesus Christ, and if you have a personal relationship with him, you're going to go to a place, someplace better. Where there's going to be no more death. No more suffering. And no more pain. Who cares about this life here on earth? 
It's only temporary. It's only our temporary home. Thank you, Lord. In Titus one sixteen. Titus one sixteen. It says such people claim they know God, but they deny him by the way they live. They are detestable and disobedient, worthless for doing anything good. Many people claim to know God. How can we know if they really do? We will not know for certain in this life, but a glance at their lifestyles will quickly tell us what they value and whether they have ordered their lives around kingdom priorities. Our conduct speaks volumes about what we believe. What do people know about God and about your faith by watching your life? I want us to turn to 1 John 2, 4 through 6. 1 John 2, 4 through 6. First John two four through six. And it says if someone claims I know God but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and is not living in the truth. But those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. That is how we know we are living in him. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. Now, how can you be sure that you belong to Christ? This passage gives Two ways to know if you do what Christ says and live as Christ one. What does Christ tell us to do? John answers in chapter 3 verse 23, believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another. True Christian faith results in loving behavior. That is why John says that the way we act can give us assurance that we belong to Christ. So Titus 1.16 says those they profess to know God but by their deeds they deny him being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. You know we can say we know God but you see it's by our fruits. Our fruits tell all. I was going to read a, another verse and I believe it was in, in I gotta find find that passage of, uh, of scripture real quick I know I said I was going to read. Uh, hang on for a second. I gotta find what I 
time where I said I was going to read, maybe the Lord wants to take me to a different viewpoint here. And the Lord is really leading me to speak what I... Hebrews 13.23. Thank you, Lord. Hebrews 13.23. Maybe he wants me to go to Hebrews 13.23. I don't know. But we'll, we'll read it. Hebrews 13.23. It says, I want you to know that our brother Timothy has been released from jail. If he comes here soon, I will bring and with me to see you. Well, that didn't, no wonder the Lord didn't want me to, to go there. It really doesn't have, like, meaning uh, to what we're talking about here. So, but anyways, in John chapter But anyways, I want to read to you a scripture, Matthew chapter 10, verse 33. It says, but whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father, who is in heaven. And... So, I'm telling you, we don't want God to deny us. We do not want God to deny us. Because life, like I said, life on this earth, life on this earth is just temporary. But I want to share with you a little bit of what ISIS is doing. And uh, Ted Cruz says ISIS uh, crucifying Christians in Iraq, nailing them to trees. And uh, I'm going to play this uh, video for you. I'm just going to sit still and while you listen to the video. It's, uh... Good morning and welcome to Inside Texas Politics. I'm Jason Whiteley. We begin this morning with U.S. Senator... Cruz making his first sit-down appearance on this program. He's spending this Labor Day speaking in Dallas and talking with us. Senator, good to see you and thanks for being with us. Thank you, Jason. Good to be with you. Let's start with the report card here. We're going to talk about border and immigration policy and things like that. But let's talk about a report card here. This fall marks two years since you were elected. How would you uh, rate your performance on behalf of Texans in that time period? Well, you know, it's actually not, not my role to, to, to rate the job. It's, it's rather the role of the people for whom I work. Uh, what I have tried to do is keep in mind that I've got 26 million bosses, that I work for every man, woman, and child in the state of Texas. And Jason, what I've tried to do more than anything else in, in the year and a half I've been in the Senate is, is two things. One, do what I said I would do. And two, tell the truth. And, and what I said when I was campaigning, what I would say now is to every Texan, hold me accountable to that. Uh, I am trying to fight every day for Texans to bring back jobs and economic growth and opportunity to defend our constitutional rights. Because that's what Texans want, and, and that's what I'm going to keep trying to do. And in that year and a half, do you have any regrets? You've made a lot of news. What I regret is that we have not yet succeeded in changing course in this country. I think we've made a lot of progress making the case to the American people that the Obama agenda isn't working. 
but we got to get to some elections. I'm very optimistic about 2014. I think Republicans are going to retake the Senate and retire Harry Reid. And I'm very optimistic about 2016 that we're going to change the course of this country altogether. Let's talk about current news right now. President Obama has threatened to give temporary legal status to millions of undocumented uh, residents here. Some conservatives in Congress say, though, uh, reportedly are, are telling uh, some members of the media they're going to tie the budget bill to the issue, raising the possibility of another government shutdown. Is that a wise strategy so close to the November election? You know, it's, it's remarkable, Jason. The, the, the one person talking incessantly about a shutdown is President Obama. And, and I understand the Democrats want to change the subject. But they can't defend the Obama economy. They can't defend Obamacare, which has cost millions of people their health care. They can't defend the crisis at the border. They certainly can't defend the Obama-Clinton foreign policy. So they want to change the subject to a shutdown. Listen, if President Obama wants this election in November to be a referendum on amnesty, I think that is an extraordinary statement of misplaced priorities. The American people don't want to see amnesty. President Obama is suggesting, going into this election, that he is unilaterally and illegally going to grant amnesty to millions of people here illegally. That is wrong. That is lawless. And if he does so, I look forward to welcoming Harry Reid back to Washington as minority leader because the American people want to see a president focused on the problems here at home, securing the border, bringing back economic growth, and not granting amnesty. That said, though, should Republicans tie that issue to the budget? Don't you, you know what? Like Republicans continue? aren't. It's Democrats who are doing that. President Obama desperately. The, the White House is tweeting out tweets about shutdowns. And this time around, they're trying to, 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 to bring up the specter of a shutdown that only Democrats are talking about because they want to change the subject. Do you know what every elected official in Washington ought to be focused on? Bringing back jobs and economic growth, turning around this disastrous Obama economy, helping Americans get back to work so that it can be easier for people who are struggling to achieve the American dream. Well, let's stick with immigration for a moment here. Are, are you concerned at all that some of your positions on, on immigration might be hurting the party's broader effort to attract Latinos or other minorities? Uh, you, you know, it, it, it's a funny thing. Uh, it, it is only in, in, in the world of, of the press that, that defending positions that 80 to 90 percent of Americans agree with are, are deemed politically risky. Americans don't want amnesty. President Obama and the Democrats are making this next election a referendum on amnesty. You know, I can tell you in, in Texas, when, when I ran for Senate, uh, I was very proud that we enjoyed tremendous support in the Hispanic community here in Texas. You know, in 2012, Mitt Romney, unfortunately, got only 27 percent of the Hispanic vote here in Texas. In the same election at the same time, I received 40% of the Hispanic vote here in Texas, which meant one in eight Hispanic voters in Texas in 2012 voted with one hand for Barack Obama and the other hand for Ted Cruz. And listen, in 2012, I was very clear. I campaigned unequivocally against amnesty. Let me tell you something that doesn't often get reported. Hispanic voters in Texas don't want amnesty. They don't want a lawless president. They don't want the border unsecured. But Senator Cornyn has made it a, a, an effort, and uh, Attorney General Greg Abbott are both reaching out to Hispanic groups and other minority groups also. Do, do you think that any of your positions might be standing in the way of that? <laughs> Look, I, I understand, Jason, those are the talking points. But, but they, they don't match with reality. I'll tell you, just a couple of months ago, I was down at the border, was, was visiting with, uh, uh, had, had a meeting, meeting in the Rio Grande Valley, had six, seven hundred people come out, standing room only to the gathering. I talked about restoring jobs and economic growth, defending our constitutional rights, restoring America's leadership in the world, not enacting amnesty. And the entire room, largely consisting of Hispanic Texans, many of them Democrats, were on their feet cheering. Most agree ISIS, the Islamic State of uh, Iraq and Syria, is a threat to the country. It's taken over a large part of, uh, of Iraq. But what kind of circumstance do you think it would take for you personally to support ground troops back into Iraq? Well, I think ISIS poses an incredible threat to us right now. We are saying, number one, ISIS is the face of evil. That they have been thrown out of Al-Qaeda for being too extreme. They're right now crucifying Christians in Iraq, literally nailing Christians to trees. We saw ISIS horribly behead an American journalist in front of the world and to declare that that jihad is coming to the United States. A strong American president would stand up and take ISIS out. We saw just this week President Obama admit he has no strategy. 
He has no strategy to deal with ISIS. That sadly is not a surprise to anyone who has watched the Obama Clinton carry foreign policy play out. But, but Senator, for you, what would it take to get ground troops back into Iraq? Can you see a circumstance where that might happen where we get your support? That there is no indication that ground troops are necessary. ISIS right now is diffused and relatively weak. Now they are strengthening. What we ought to be using is military air, air power to bomb them back to Syria. Continue to what doing to, now to, or more? No, no, no. What we're doing now is is so often the Obama administration has treated foreign policy, has treated military action as a press release, as making a statement. You know, I'm reminded back when, when President Obama was was trying to advocate attacking Syria. And John Kerry described what they wanted to do as a, quote, unbelievably small attack. We need to stop doing PR foreign policy. The objective in Iraq should be to prevent ISIS from coming back here and murdering Americans. And we can do that using air power taking them out. Texas. Last topic here. You get pelted with presidential questions all the time. <laughs> We're not going to ask you whether you're running, but do you have ambitions higher than the U.S. Senate? You know... What my ambition is focused on is, is doing everything I can to help turn this country around. For the first time in the history of our country, a majority of Americans believe their kids will not inherit a better world. In over 200 years of our nation's history, that's never been true except right now. And so what my focus is on is we have to change course. At this point, it's not a matter of partisan politics. It's not right or left. The Obama agenda isn't working. As a matter of common sense, domestically, the economy is in shambles. Millions of people are hurting. Internationally, the world is on fire. And my ambition, more than anything else, is to work to help mobilize and energize millions of Americans to say, let's change the path we're on. Let's get back to the free market principles and constitutional liberties this country was built on. That's how we turn this country around. And, and that's what I'm trying to do every day, fighting for 26 million Texans. So it sounds like you do have some higher ambitions. My ambitions are for this country to change the path we're on. And I intend to do everything I can to help encourage and mobilize millions of Americans to do just that. Senator Ted Cruz, good to see you again. Thank you very much. Always a pleasure. All right. <laughs> so, oh, um, so, anyways, um, let me read um, what the article says here. It says, We were unaware of a horrible turn against Christians in Iraq until U.S. Senator Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz brought it up. He's the guy you heard in the video. He said the Texas Republican, a possible 2016 presidential candidate, recently told a reporter for WFAA TV Channel 8 in Dallas that the Islamic State group in the news for numerous acts, including killings of two U.S. journalists, well, it's been more now since this article has come out, is right now crucifying Christians in Iraq literally nailing Christians to trees. Crucifixions as in killing someone by nailing or tying his or her hands and feet to a cross or as Cruz said, a tree. And they emailed Cruz's office about how he knew of the crucifixions and received no evidence in reply. And this channel, I guess WFAA, Dallas, they said their own research did not undercover news stories confirming the crucifixion of Christians in Iraq or elsewhere. Well, U.S. advocates and experts on their bloody conflicts in Iraq and Syria expressed unfamiliarity with such actions. But Christians, along with people of other faiths, have been in the crossfire of the conflicts in Iraq and Syria. On August 8, 2014, a CNN news story said Iraq's largest Christian town had been overrun by ISIS causing thousands of Christians in the city to flee just as other minority groups targeted by ISIS had done as well as Shittle Muslims uh, the story said or oh, Shiite Muslims sorry uh, CNN said the French government confirmed the Iraqi city of Karkosh had fallen into the hands of ISIS. The story said ISIS earlier took over Mosul, another city in Iraq, prompting 
many residents to flee to Karkush, I'm trying to pronounce it right, in Mansoul, CNN said ISIS issued an ultimatum to Christians living there. And, and this is what we're probably going to be facing here in America and things to come. Convert to Islam, pay a fine, or, or face death by the sword. I want to, like I said earlier, you know, the word of the Lord, it clearly states that um, if we deny God, God will deny us. And folks, we don't want that. We do not want that to happen at all. You see, life here on earth, like I said, it's only temporary. What's more important, ladies and gentlemen, your, your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ or your life here on this temporary earth? Ladies and gentlemen, I do not want temporary life. I want eternal life, forever life. I don't want to have to worry about going through another death again once I'm in the place with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I don't have to worry anymore about about any stress or, tor or turmoil. I don't have to worry about terrorists. I don't have to worry about the economy. I don't have to worry about bills or, or finances. I don't have to worry about health problems. I don't have to worry about, um, about whether, or, I don't have to worry about anything anymore when I'm in heaven. All that is going to be gone. But you see, why settle for the temporary when we can have the eternal? You see, are you going to... I mean, ISIS issued an ultimatum to Christians over in Iraq and Syria either convert to Islam, pay a fine, or face death by the sword, what are you going to do? If you convert to Islam, you know, you're giving up a gift that's eternal and you're going to take something that can lead you into, dam into eternal damnation. Pay a fine, what is that fine? Money? It doesn't say. Or face death by the sword. Well, you know what you can say? You can say, you want to take me? I'm going to a better place. You can say, farewell to this temporary earth. And you're going to be welcomed into the eternal earth where you don't have to worry about anything anymore. You're going to be in a place of peace. You're going to be in a place of protection. You're going to be, I mean, words cannot describe heaven. Okay, words cannot describe what heaven is like. Okay, I'll just simply say this, for, for, for those of you that like tropical island getaways, heaven will even be better than that. I mean, I mean, for those of you that want to know what heaven is like, you know, maybe you ought to rent, rent the movie or buy the movie, Heaven is For Real. That will give you a definition of what heaven will be like. Amen. Or buy a book about what heaven is like. Because I'm telling you, 
heaven will be a place of eternity. You see, you're not going to find eternity here on this earth. You're going to find eternity with Him, with Jesus, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So, ladies and gentlemen, if we, like, say for example, if ISIS did come after you, whatever, and they say, convert to Islam, pay a fine, or face death by the sword. Well, if you take death by the sword, praise God. You're, you're going from temporary to eternal. What's better, temporary or eternal? I'd rather have the eternal. If I were you, Amen? So, but you see, enough, enough about that. I, I just want to close with, um, close with this statement here. And it says, in 2 Timothy 1 7, and I believe I read it. It says, For the Spirit of for the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self discipline. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, let's go from the temporary to the eternal. Amen. I think that's what the spirit of the Lord is, is revealing to his people. I feel like that is the the message in one sentence. This message in one sentence. Go from the go from the temporary to the eternal. It's time to get out of the temporary and into the eternal. Amen. Now if you haven't received Jesus Christ into your heart, I want to give you that opportunity right now to receive Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior. Dear Lord Jesus, I, I confess to you that I am a sinner. Lord, I pray right now that you wash me, cleanse me, renew me, mold me into the person that you want me to be, Father. Lord, help me to do what you have called me to do. And Lord, help me to put my faith my hope, my trust, my confidence in you, Lord Jesus. And I will give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. God be with you. I'll see you again. God bless.